Hi, my name is Randy Bowman. I'm the uh, treasurer for the Desert Southwest Annual Conference. Cokesbury does these booklets for most of the administrative and other committees that a church has. What I have provided in your materials is kind of a four-page summary of that that's going to be on pages six through nine. The main purpose of the finance committee is to nurture financial vitality in the congregation. What you really are trying to do is develop the trust among the people so that they're comfortable that when they give you money, that you're using it for the purposes that they asked you to use it for. Making sure that you have clear financial reports, perhaps some summarized ones that are available for the general congregation. If somebody wants the full-blown detail, wants to look at 61 pages, let them do it. You want to have the attitude that we're not trying to hide anything here. We're trying to provide some maybe condensed information that you need to know so that you understand the state of our congregation so that we can all pitch in and address whatever we need to address together. Other things that the booklet talks about are having the segregation of duties. Again, easier at some larger churches than it is at, at some of the smaller ones, but you have to, to choose and do the best that you can. Talks about the reconciliations, with, which we also emphasized how um, important they are in maintaining control over cash, which is, if you're ever gonna have fraud, it, it's pretty much gonna rely on cash. I mean, occasionally it could, somebody could take physical equipment, but most of the fraud that we ever see deals with theft of money. Um, so if you're reconciling it, it's key, and if something happens, you need to carefully craft how to inform the congregation as well. Some of these other procedures can help prevent it. Having your volunteers and employees well trained. Depending on the level of turnover, how large you are, that may be easier said than done. If the previous finance chair left and moved away and you weren't elected as the new finance chair and didn't have any overlap, it's tough. Perhaps they are willing to be consulted on phone or perhaps there's somebody else in the church that can answer some of your questions or there might be people in neighboring churches or be me. I may not be able to know all the answers, but I can put you in touch. But the ideal thing is if you can have the person doing the job train the new person before they leave. It just makes things go a lot smoother and it builds the confidence in the people out in the pews who are giving the money. Most of the giving is general fund operating purposes, no designation at all, but the donor in some cases may give for a particular purpose, a building fund or a mission trip or that sort of stuff. You need to track those separately, report on them separately, um, because if that's not done, you can lose the confidence of the donor not only for that particular purpose, but if you can't handle giving for that mission trip, why should I give you anything? I, you know, until this thing gets under control, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop giving. So trust is, is a big reason why we're after financial transparency. As far as missional budgeting, the main emphasis is that you don't start with the dollars. You start with what, it, what ministry it is that you want to accomplish and figure out how you're going to raise the funds to do that. And if you can't raise all that you think you need, then you need to understand what portion of the ministry can we streamline or cut out or what's the highest priority so that we can use the dollars and the resources that we think we will have to do what's most important. Dream and then if you need to scale back that dream based on reality, um, you do that. And a lot of the best practices we've talked about need to be focusing on the mission of the church and not on your particular interest. You may be, you know, mission trips might be your focus, but there's a lot of ministry that the church in its entirety needs to decide what to do. You need to collectively decide what your emphasis is going to be, and then once that's decided, go along with it. Not say, well, uh, they didn't prioritize in the same way that I would have personally done. You know, this isn't about you individually. So speak. Once it's decided, you know, move forward. Understand it talks in here, the connectional nature of apportionments are not a tax, they're not a big taboo thing. They are a way of connecting with other United Methodists across the conference, across the United States, across 
the world. Mechanically, what apportionments are, are simply taking the conference budget and then allocating them out to the churches and asking each church to pay its fair share. And we have some formulas that decide what a fair share is, but essentially the larger a church is, either in terms of membership a little bit or in terms of money they're able to spend on their own ministries, which is primarily it, then the bigger the piece of the apportionment pie we're asking them to participate in. But that conference budget includes a lot of stuff that enables an individual congregation to do ministry to a much greater extent than they could do on their own. It does a, lo a lot of missionary support, um, communication resources so we can evangelize. It truly does touch the church all over the world to a much greater extent when we take all the congregations, United Methodist congregations in primarily the U.S., but everywhere, and add together the power that those dollars and can produce is, is much more significant than even if you think of the largest non-denominational church. They're, they're still going to be limited to much less than what we can do together. If we understand that connectional nature of we're thinking about people, not just our own neighbors in our own congregation, then you can accomplish a, a lot of ministry and be proud of, of, of what you're doing. And that is truly one of the best practices that's included in the guidelines. In addition to kind of the global emphasis that we get through our general church, your apportionments directly impact what's happening within the conference. We do new church starts, critically important for the growth of our denomination. But a lot of these new models of not a traditional brick and mortar, but trying to reach the, the younger people. And your apportionments are supporting that. You're supporting campus ministries at the four major universities in our conference. U of A, ASU, NAU, UNLV. Very critical time in people's lives where they're really searching. Your apportionments support camping, which is where many of our clergy and laity had that traditional or mountaintop experience where, you know, being out in God's creation enabled them to truly feel the call and inspire them to a lifetime of service. Some of the places that we identify the most in terms of our apportionment support are the urban ministries of support. I mean, these organizations that are dealing with homelessness, hunger, I mean, frontline ministry that, that do a great job and depend on our support. We're able to subsidize some of these congregations that may be the only mainline Christian denomination for miles around. And we do that through our equitable compensation fund. These are just you know, some of the examples of how you're doing much more than just supporting your local church. Now, the vast majority of what people give stays in the local church. If you look nationally, about 85 cents of every dollar stays in the local church, and the other 15 cents goes to support the conference apportionments. And about 20 percent of that 15 percent goes on to the general church for the global connection and the rest stays here. This particular guidelines book is a way to help your congregation understand that as one of the best practices. After it goes through that congregational vitality, the booklet talks a little bit about the theological foundation, just briefly. And I think at some level we all understand this. We may not truly grasp it in our heart or be willing to totally commit to it, but everything that we have is a gift from God. We're just kind of keeping care of it while we're here on earth. In that sense, we are stewards, we are not owners. And they remind us briefly in, in this book, if we can have that as a theological foundation for all of what we're doing as a finance committee, then, then we're better off. What are the responsibilities of the finance committee and who, who are the members? The responsibilities include stewardship, like we talked about, including perhaps an annual campaign. It includes developing an annual budget, hopefully thinking missionally and not just straight dollars and cents. Responsibilities include developing internal control policies and having those available, making sure that the annual audit gets done, making sure that the reporting gets done, not only to people in the congregation, but some of the reports we've talked about earlier to external entities like tax entities. Page seven will list out who the members of the finance committee would be. And this would not necessarily apply if you've got a single board governance, but if you have a traditional finance committee, would be generally in the 12-person range. 
again, might be more challenging at, at some of the, the smaller ones. One other thing interesting to note is that paid staff, certain positions, if a larger church, participate, like the financial secretary or business administrator or somebody like that, but they participate without vote. The pastor, however, participates and does participate with vote. You need to have at least quarterly meetings. I think most churches probably have them monthly. Perhaps they skip a month during the summer, maybe holidays. But I think most finance committees are probably meeting at least 10 times per year. And then you'll have certain reporting to the congregation and the administrative council that comes out of that. And the last part of the book talks about the positions, the primary ones being the treasurer and the financial secretary. We've talked a little bit already that the treasurer is responsible for two main things, the money going out, dispersing the funds, and reporting to the congregation what's happened with all of the money in and out. Whereas the financial secretary is responsible for the money coming in, supervising the offering counts, recording it in the donor records, and depositing the cash in the bank. And then the finance committee chair is responsible for over overseeing all of that. So it lays out some pretty good job descriptions. Hopefully you're able to effectively recruit and, and train the people in all of those positions. So again, I commend this to you. If you want to get a little bit of a flavor for this summary, or if you don't want to buy the book and just want this summary, I have it in word form and you can just request it. The next section we're going to talk about is a really good one. It's the Local Church Audit Guide. It's going to enable you to make sure your church is meeting the audit requirements that should be happening every year. It's really good information, even if besides using it for the purposes of the audit, it includes good information on some controls that we've talked about, but that you may want to make sure that you have in, in place. The Book of Discipline assigns the responsibility for the annual audit of the financial records to the Committee on Finance. So you need to make sure it's taking place. And a lot of questions that we get are, what does an audit mean? So if you go over to page 17, it tells you. And basically, the larger a church is, the more likely you're going to have to go out and get an outside CPA audit, which is going to cost you some money. We at the conference get an annual outside CPA audit. It costs us $18,000 a year. We have maybe eight to $10 million of revenue. But there are churches who, a few that could have more than that. You're probably looking at a minimum of 5000 for an outside. If you need some recommendations on possible auditors, I have some pretty good contacts here in the Phoenix area who would probably cover most of Arizona. Uh, one or two, but not a whole lot in, in Nevada. Bullet points two, three, four, and five. If you have a church that has less than $500,000 a year in annual receipts, which is probably the majority of our churches, you do not ever need an outside CPA audit. You can get an independent person in the church to do the audits. That means somebody who's not on finance committee, but capable of going through the procedures they lay out for you. Or you could make arrangements with somebody at another church to come in and swap. You know, I'll do your audit if you do ours. That's always a possibility. But you know, you get somebody on a volunteer basis and not cost you anything, and you have complied with the audit requirements. 500000 less than a million dollars in receipts, then you need to get an outside CPA audit that you'll pay for once every three years. One to two million dollars in annual receipts, once every two years. If you have a church that has more than two million dollars of receipts in a year, the requirement is an outside CPA audit every year. Even though we're not a church, you know, at the conference we're paying for it every year because we have more than two million dollars in receipts. If you turn over to page 19, it says, who is included in the audit? Any entity within the church that's a ministry of the church that's using the church federal tax identification number needs to be included in the audit. So for example, if you have a preschool that you're operating and they're using the church's tax ID number and you're paying those preschool teachers on the 941 using the church's tax ID number, all of that income from the tuition payments needs to be factored into that. If you're leasing it to a charter school, some of your property, then all you have to count is the rental income from the charter school, not all the money that they bring in. United Methodist women are an exception. Per the Book of Discipline, they need to be audited, but not combined with the churches. They are separately audited. They are not under the control of the church, but are in fact under the control of the UMW local unit. United Methodist men are included. That pastor's discretionary fund we talked about earlier, that, that's included. 
If you're operating a Boy Scout troop under yours, all their finances need to be included if they're not separate. Memorial funds are included, you know, trustees, all that stuff. Essentially, everything that is a ministry or an operation of the church using your tax ID number needs to be included. And the procedures that they're doing on internal controls and on the receipts and disbursements, the money's coming in and out. We've talked quite a bit about those related to the treasurer and the financial secretary. Appendix A, which is pages 25 to 29 on this, lays out the recommended procedures. So this is literally what if you're a small church that has $100,000 of income and you could get somebody who's willing to do the work, they could take these procedures and do it. If you look on Appendix B, it has this checklist that they could use, yes or no. It's very similar to that best practices checklist that we talked about earlier. So it's a good thing, not just for the audit, but also for just making sure that as you develop, you're responsible for developing the internal control policies. Uh, if they're addressing all that, you probably have some pretty good ones. Which is a little bit of an aside, if you don't have developed written policies and you're looking for sample ones, I have a few of those from sample churches from different conferences or even from within our conference that you could email me and I could get get those to you. The auditor's written report needs to include certain things. If you look on page 23 of the list, you know, what procedures did I perform? I need a balance sheet, I need a statement of activities or statement of changes in net assets or old time vernacular profit and loss statement, that sort of stuff needs to be in there and any internal control comments that they have. This needs to be included even if it's a volunteer from the church. It can be very informal, but it needs to address those auditors written report that are listed on page 23. If you have an outside CPA audit, just their own professional standards will dictate that they address that so you don't have to worry about it. But if you have a volunteer performing the audit, take a look at those requirements and make sure it's in writing and it includes those. This is a pretty good document, not only just for the audit, but for general reference purposes, particularly as it relates to the controls you may be developing.